So as a way of introduction, I just wanted to give you a quick introduction to basic lipid biology of microalgae. Like all cellular organisms, microalgae contain large quantities of lipids in the form of membrane-bound phospholipids that encompass both the thylakoid as well as the cytoplasmic membrane. And again, these are predominantly phospholipids. Many, or most, microalgae also accumulate large quantities of lipids in the form of triacial glycerols, which accumulate within the cytoplasm both as lipid droplets as well, or also known colloquially as lipid bodies. Fatty acid molecules associated with these membrane phospholipids, as well as the triacial glycerol containing lipid droplets, can account for, in some microalgae, upwards of 50% or more of the um, cellular weight, dry cellular weight, of certain microalgae strains. Most importantly, for the purposes of this particular talk, some microalgae can also accumulate upwards of 50 to 60% of the total fatty acids within the cell as these long-chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. So you've probably already heard in this series of lectures about the biotechnological potential of microalgae. One of the major reasons promoting microalgae as biote biotechnological resources for biomass as well as for as biofactories for, for example, um, biofuel production is this copious production of lipids within microalgae cells. And so now I want to kind of pivot a little bit and talk a little bit specifically about some of these omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids that accumulate within certain microalgae strains. But first, it is important to have an understanding about the nomenclature of fatty acids. This becomes important when we begin to talk about some of the health benefits that long-chain omega-3s in particular have in animal and human health. So here we see an example molecule known as oleic acid. This is an 18-carbon, one-double bond monounsaturated fatty acid. Oleic acid happens to be one of the most dominant fatty acids present, for example, in olive oil. So one, for a naming convention, we can begin counting the total number of carbons in any fatty acid molecule beginning at the carboxyl terminal, also known as the alpha carbon. So in this example, we can see this fatty acid molecule has 18 carbons. Thus, it is a C18 fatty acid. As a complementary convention, we can also count carbons starting at the other end, or the omega carbon, of the molecule. So here we can see we can count from the back, starting at carbon 18 relative to the alpha, carbon 1, 2, 3, out to 9, where we see the introduction of a double bond at the 9 carbon position. Consequently, because of this naming convention, we can see that this example fatty acid contains 18 carbons with one double bond at the ninth alpha carbon. Consequently, we would abbreviate this molecule 18 colon 1 delta 9. That delta 9 is synonymous with the omega position of that double bond. The convention here is we typically will describe fatty acids with a number, colon, and a number. The number preceding the colon is the number of carbon atoms within the molecule. The number following the colon is the number of unsaturations or double bond. And the delta is the position relative to the omega carbon where those double bonds are introduced, where they're first introduced, most importantly. So the table below shows some additional examples of common fatty acids. Foremost, we can see palmitic acid at the top there, also known, scientific name, hexadecanoic acid. This is a 16 carbon, zero double bond, or a saturated fatty acid that's very common in animal fats, as well as some plants. Think of it as butter. Going down to some of these other examples, the final example is eicosapentaenoic acid, also known as EPA, or at the carboxyl reference, a 20 colon 5 omega-3 fatty acid. And these are the molecules that I'm going to be discussing today. As you can see from this molecule, and I'll give other examples momentarily, this 20 carbon 5 double bond fatty acid contains 5 unsaturations at the 5, 8, 11, 14, and 17 position relative to the omega carbon. This unsaturation pattern is the reason we call these an omega-3. The first introduction of the fatty acid relative to the omega occurs 3 carbons in from the end of the molecule. Okay. So with the nomenclature now in, in place, we can now begin to understand why omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids are important. And I'll leave it to say that there are many different cellular effects omega-3 fatty acids have at the molecular level, level on biological cells. Foremost, owing to those long chain lengths and the numerous unsaturations, five or six unsaturations the omega-3s typically carry, alter membrane physical properties. Most importantly, fluidization, allowing membranes to maintain optimal 
uh, homeostasis fluidity to allow biological processes to occur, ranging from transport uh, to membrane signaling processes. Also, the long chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids are incredibly important as important precursor molecules when released from phospholipids can be converted into anti-inflammatory compounds such as the eicosanoids, which have pleiotropic effects on cell biology. Similarly, these long chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids can also um, be converted into um, leuco leukocyte mediated uh, conversion to platelet derived resolvents and protectins which help mediate positive outcomes of inflammation responses in biological cells. And lastly, these molecules can also modulate membrane channel and G protein coupled receptor activity at sites of the membrane while also serving as ligands for nuclear receptors and transcription factors within the nucleus itself. So given the variety variety of, of um, bioactivities of these long chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, it's understandable to see the various benefits that a diet rich in omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids has on animal and human health. Known colloquially as heart smart fats, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids have been known for, dec for decades, recognized for decades, as having very positive effects on cardiovascular health, hypertriglyceridemia, um, there's even commercial products such as Lavaza, which are marine-derived long-chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids that are prescription to treat various heart, heart defects. Likewise, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids have key um, activities in neural as well as eye development. They've also been implicated in a variety of disease states, including various cancers, inflammation disorders, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and others. So given the popularity of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, given their many different positive health benefits, it's not too surprising of why omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids have emerged as a very important um, industry in the, nutraceutical, uh, in the nutraceutical market. And it's important to understand that humans synthesize very limited amounts of EPA and DHA, as I'll discuss in a moment, why the commercial market for these compounds is currently rather large globally and is only expanding. So humans, unlike microorganisms, including microalgae, mammals cannot synthesize EPA, long chain 20 colon 5 omega-3, or DHA, a very long chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid that contains 22 carbons and six double bonds. They cannot synthesize these compounds de novo. Rather, we lie, rely on dietary habits and the metabolic processing of precursor shorter chain, for example, 18 carbon fatty acids to finally produce these important long chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. So for example, we humans eat plant derived materials that are enriched in things like 18 colon 2 and omega-6 fatty acid and 18 colon 3 N3, also known as alpha linolenic acid, derived from plants and our bodies are able to then elongate and desaturase through the concerted action of these two enzyme classes to produce the final products such as EPA and DHA in the human body. Alternatively, humans can ingest EPA and DHA directly from dietary sources, sources rich in these omega-3 PUFAs, such as consuming marine fish. This includes salmon, tuna, mackerel, sardine, menhaden, anchovy, etc. So given these various health benefits and the humans and humans inability to synthesize these important molecules de novo, it's perhaps not surprising that omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid supplements are the most popular dietary supplements in the U.S. The graph to the left shows that in a study uh, survey conducted in 2012 by the National Institutes of Health here in the U.S., approximately 8% of adults consume fish oil or omega-3 fatty acid nutraceutical compound capsules on a daily basis. And if you've been to any supermarket or been to any um, health food store, for example, I'm sure you've seen there are plenty of options on the market to get omega-3 fish oils that you can take to get your dietary supplement of these long chain omega-3 fatty acids. However, given that the vast uh, majority of the market share for omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids is derived from wild marine fish species, it is clear that the future of omega-3 market is not sustainable in terms of fish. 
Every year, approximately 16 million tons of wild fish, predominantly forage fish species such as anchovy, menhaden, sardine, etc., are harvested specifically for the purpose of converting that, the, those fish products into fish oil or fish meal specifically to feed animals or to convert them and put them into fish capsules for the human market. However, as we all know, global fisheries are declining at alarming rate around the, the global ocean, and new sources of omega-3s are sorely needed to meet growing demand in this emerging market. So now we can go back to the microalgae. Omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids in the marine environment, in the marine environment, microalgae are the primary producers of these long-chain omega-3s in the ocean. So microalgae, including green algae, chlorophytes, diatoms, and dinoflagellates at the base of the photosynthetic food web produce large quantities of these compounds. These microalgae are subsequently grazed upon through trophic accumulation and bioamplification. Those omega-3s produced by microalgae are now encapsulated within the predators that have consumed them, for example, the zooplankton, which are subsequently consumed by small fish, which are consumed by larger fish, which ultimately end up on our dinner plate. Or these fish are captured directly for human consumption and milled into fish oil or fish meal, which can then be sold as nutraceutical compounds. So as an alternative, as I mentioned before, to harvesting fish for the specific purpose of turning these into omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid supplements, one solution is to collect, to grow microalgae in high volume systems and high density and use these microalgae as a direct source of omega-3s for the nutraceutical market or directly as animal feed. If you go to the supermarket today, you will probably have seen that there are many algae-derived omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid, fatty acid uh, products in the public marketplace. Specifically, companies such as Royal DSM, a Dutch multinational, has produced a variety of products ranging from milk to eggs to juices to infant formula to tortillas that are enriched in algae, microalgae derived, DHA in particular, docosahexaenoic acid, again, a 22 carbon six double bond long chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. However, it's, when you look at this emerging market, which is um, a multi-million, hundreds of million dollars a year industry in the U.S. alone, the production of these long-chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids as food ad additives largely derive from heterotrophic, meaning non-photosynthetic strains, such as um, dinoflagellates, Cryptogodinium coenii, and various other heterotrophic microalgae strains, sh such as the labyrinthulomycetes. Remarkably, some of these strains can produce greater than 70% of their total biomass as oil in terms of percent dry weight, with greater than 50% of this oil in the form of DHA. So this becomes a very cost-effective and an efficient way to supplement functional foods with heart, smart, healthy omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. But again, this is not fully taking advantage of the photosynthetic capacity of various microalgae strains. So what does the future of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids look like? As you've already heard in this series of lectures, the capacity of, um, of microalgae to be grown in outdoor pond systems to very high density, specifically elite production strains that are enriched in these omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, such as EPA and DHA, lends itself directly for input into the emerging omega-3 nutraceutical and animal feed market. For example, we can grow large-scale algae in cultivation systems, we can harvest that biomass, and we can extract those omega-3 rich oils and place those into nutraceutical compounds for purchase by uh, the global population, for example. Importantly, no fish were harmed in the processing of these omega-3 capsules. Likewise, we can begin to harvest that same biomass, and rather than extracting the oils directly, we can pelletize that algae and convert that algae biomass, again, which is enriched in those omega-3s, and feed that, provide that, for example, as a feed additive for aquaculture species, providing sustainable seafood rich in omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids that can be enjoyed three times a week. Well, I hope you enjoyed this brief lecture on omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty, uh, fatty acids in algae, um, and thank you for your time.